This is the big one, 007. That's right, Em, it is the big one. I've seen a few James Bond ranking lists floating around the internet recently, and I thought, why not toss my bowler-rimmed hat into the sumo ring? And also, why not tackle the biggest video possible as my first proper YouTube video? So wish me luck with that. Now, how did I compile this list? Well, I used various different methods. The sorted.app website is quite a good idea for compiling a list if you're not really good at that sort of thing. It makes you choose between a few Bond movies and then you click, oh, I prefer this one. Oh no, I prefer this one. And then it'll make a list for you at the end and you can go, oh, that's my list. So that came in handy when I was making the list, but ultimately I kind of just went on feeling because I'd look at the list and go, ah, oh, well, I'd actually kind of move them. So that's what I did in the end. It's not the most groundbreaking or controversial list out there, but what it did do was it made me realize how many of these films I genuinely love. Like, besides the bottom three on the list, I think I really love all these movies. And instead of dissing the worst movie, worst in quotation marks, I'm going to try focus on the things I love in each of the movies and kind of outline the things I'm not fond of. Here we go. Twenty-seven. And counting. Yeah, it's it's never say never again. Look, I don't hate this movie. I don't think anyone really sees it in the same breath as every other James Bond movie. It's its own thing. So for those of you who don't know, a man named Kevin McClory uh, got into a bit of a fracas with Ian Fleming about the rights to the James Bond movies, and as a result, Never Say Never Again happened. And yeah, th there's not really a hell of a lot to say about this movie. I think the thing that puts it down at the bottom of the list is is that's kind of just really boring. And there's it's just a remake of Thunderball and it's not as good as Thunderball. It has its moments. There's some really, really good things in it. The kitchen fight is quite badass and really fun. I think the scene where Bond and Largo play... can't remember the name of the game thing. But they play the, like that early computer game thing. I think that's really interesting. I also, for some reason, really like the theme song. It's it's terrible, but I kind of love it. I think it's really silly, but also gets really stuck in my head. I'll give that as a positive. The other glaringly positive thing about this movie is Barbara Carrera as Fatima Blush. She's excellent. She's probably one of the best femme fatales in the series, even if you include all the Eon Bonds. And that's, like, that's a high bar to get to. It just doesn't feel like a Bond movie, and I think that's the biggest failing of it and like they didn't have the rights to all the stuff that people were used to at that stage so i think he can give the movie a pass on that yeah it's just a bit it's just a bit boring and uninspired and it's really mad to think that the same fella who directed this also directed the empire strikes back reverend kirshner so there's some food for thought never never say never 26 and counting And Die Another Day is a movie I've really turned around on in the last, I'd say, about seven or eight years. It was initially a movie I hated, as you could see from my letterbox review, where I gave it half a star. Yeah, it was a, it was a bit petty on my part. But Die Another Day has a lot of actually, I think, quite decent bits. Pierce Brosnan, you can always depend on him to deliver a good Bond performance. I think he's quite steady through Tomorrow Never Dies, The World Is Not Enough, and Die Another Day. Some of the action is great. The ice chase feels like a classic Bond car chase. The fencing scene in Blades is suitably classy, and the hovercraft chase is also very fun. Gustav Graves is a fun villain. He's suitably daft and has a smarminess, which always makes me chuckle. David Arnold, per usual, provides a stellar score. And I think the potential of this movie is obvious to see. The idea is in theory, sound great, but they just turn into a lackluster affair. 
the movie falls metaphorically and literally off a cliff once it gets to the Ice Palace. The dialogue, I think, is the worst of the series. It's cringy at best. Halle Berry, usually a great actress, gives probably the worst Bond girl performance with Jinx. The CGI doesn't hold up at all. I don't even know if it was even up in the first place. And ultimately, the plot isn't great. It feels like a rehash of the other Bond plots where there's a thing in space that's going to destroy the world and it just doesn't work. I wish Die Another Day was better, but unfortunately of all the Eon Bonds, I think it's the worst. 24. And counting. Right, now we're getting into the old meat and potatoes of this list. Everything from here on out, I love, I adore, I think you're great. But unfortunately, one has to be number 24. And in this case, it's Diamonds Are Forever. With this one, Connery seems to be enjoying himself a lot more than he did in You Only Live Twice. And to be honest, that wouldn't really take much. The script is hilarious. Tom Mankiewicz writes some of the best dialogue in the series. Some of his one-liners are absolute gold. I was just out walking my rat and I seem to have lost my way. I love the sass of Tiffany Case. I think she's a really fun character who really suits the tone of the movie. The music in this one is particularly great. Barry is kind of always on point around this time. Shirley Bassey gives a bombastic performance in Diamonds Are Forever. Camp Blofeld, along with Mr. Wint and Mr. Kidd, make for some really fun villains. As for the drawbacks, it's the first major tonal shift in a Bond movie, to the point where you could be forgiven for thinking that it's an entirely different series now. Also, the plot's needlessly complicated, and trying to track where the diamonds are at any given time can be an absolute head wreck. The ending on the oil barge is also quite anticlimactic, and the action throughout the movie isn't mind-blowing. It's kind of plodding, which is maybe a good way to describe diamonds. But, as I said, everything after Die Another Day I love, but... Something had to go here, and sadly it's diamonds. Also that funky bass line in the theme song. Mwah. Chef's kiss. 23. 22. And 21. And counting. Right. I feel kind of bad about this one. I'm putting For Your Eyes Only, Octopussy, and The View to a Kill, like, all together. And again, I feel really bad about this. But the reason is, they all give me the same feeling. They're all warm, cosy Sunday afternoon Bond. Roger's steadily slipped into his dad Bond era. He's charming, he's funny, but his age just brings him to a time where he looked slightly too old for the part and then very old for the part in A View to a Kill. I don't mind the age though, I just tend to go along with it. He brings more levity to the role, especially in For Your Eyes Only, where it seems to be a slightly darker tone. The plots in all the movies are suitably Bondian. It's at the height of the whole Soviet Cold War Bond connection. General Gogol just turns up in every movie. All these movies have great allies too. Topol, VJ, and Godfrey Tibbet. They're always lovely to see pop up whenever you're watching one of these movies. If I had to rank them, I'd put Octopussy number 23. It's a really fun Bond. Camille Khan's a great villain. There's some great action in the movie. It has a cool plot and some amazing Bondian moments. Double sixes always gets me a bit giddy. Fancy that. I'd put a view to a kill, number 22. Christopher Walken is just wonderful. I love an over-the-top villain and he fulfills the brief to the fullest. Mayday is an iconic henchwoman. The action isn't mind-blowing, but you know, it has its moments. It's also really funny to play spot the stunt double with this movie. It's not very hard, I won't lie. For your eyes only, then, would come number 21. It's the most unique out of all of these. It's the one where Bond comes down to Earth after the literal highs of Moonraker. The score is noticeably different, but refreshing from Bill Conte. The tone is quite interesting. It's not as quippy, and in a way feels like a Sunday afternoon detective show. These movies feel very different but also very similar like i said they all give me the same warm feeling and it's hard to separate my love for them which is why they're here and again i feel really bad so don't come at me 20 and counting the man with the golden gun is a really fun time but over the years has kind of come down on my list probably the most of any other bond movie Christopher Lee is excellent, Hervé Villagé is excellent, the villains in general in the movie are some of the best in the franchise. I might be in the minority, but I love some of John Barry's music cues in this one. I know it wasn't his favourite score, but for me it's a standout. The locations are also a standout in this movie. Scaramanga's island is iconic, and who doesn't want to own that beautiful boat? This might be Roger's coldest performance. 
well, he is at his charming best in a lot of the scenes. He can also be very cold and callous in others. Then you have Louisiana's finest sheriff, J.W. Pepper. His return is not entirely needed, if you ask me, but it's a welcome inclusion. He's the epitome of silly comedy in Bond movies, and I just love him. <laughs> I always found it cool that Scaramanga was meant to be the bad version of Bond, and the fact he only needs one shot makes for a tense final sequence in the funhouse. Despite all this, the film feels flat. It lacks the major thrills of other Bond movies and ends up feeling slightly out of place in the franchise, something more akin to a Hong Kong Kung Fu B-movie in places. The production values also seem to be at its lowest in the series, feeling a lot cheaper than, say, something like The Spy Who Loved Me. The Man with the Golden Gun is one that ranks low on a lot of lists I've seen, but I find myself coming around to watch it more often than a lot of other Bond movies. 19. And counting. Quantum of Solace was in the same boat as Die Another Day for me, a movie that was at the bottom of the list I didn't really like, but has shot up in the last two years. Daniel is fantastic in this movie. He plays the heartbroken and cold James Bond perfectly. I love his character arc from Casino through Quantum, going from getting his double O, being a rough around the edges secret agent, falling in love with Vesper, being betrayed and retreating back into his shell, spending this movie coming to terms with his emotions and who he is as a secret agent, watching Camille act on her revenge, seeing what it does to a person, and ultimately settling into his role as a double O. Speaking of Camille, I think she's also great in this movie. She doesn't fall into the various stereotypes that plague a lot of other Bond girls. Like Bond, she feels broken, and Olga Kirilenko gives a wonderful performance. And the opera scene is like top tier Bond. This might be where Daniel is at his best sneaky Bond, floating around the venue, finding out info, infiltrating Quantum, Oh, it's just delightful. Unfortunately, the shortcomings of this movie are fairly clear to see. The editing is, I think, the worst in the franchise. It feels nauseous at times. The plot is also uninspiring, always seeming to play second fiddle to Bond's personal character arc. Dominic Green is a serviceable villain at best. Quantum has continued to grow on me, and I feel like over time it'll slowly creep its way up the list. 18. And counting. I found it hard to place Pierce Brosnan's third outing on this list. Firstly, Elektra as the main villain is great to see. She plays the damsel turned femme fatale perfectly. She's sexy, seductive, while also feeling dangerous and psychotic. Renard is a cool henchman who slots nicely into playing second fiddle to Elektra. The brief titles has also been one of my favourites in the series. Bond adjusting his tie underwater will forever be one of the coolest moments in any Bond movie. The action's exciting and well, Pierce is Pierce. By this time, he's just settled into the role perfectly, and he looks the business. The plot is fine, but I think the movie feels a bit slow at times. Denise Richards' as Christmas Jones is certainly a choice. She's done absolutely no favours, though, by some terrible dialogue. Are you here for a reason? Or are you just hoping for a glimmer? The way Pierce delivers... James Bond! James Bond! ...will never fail to make me laugh. Ultimately, the movie just slots into the fun Bond movie category without being a major standout for me. It's got a banging theme song, though. 17. And counting. This movie will always have a special place in my heart. Spectre's the first Bond movie I ever saw in the cinema. Daniel seems to be at his most charming. I love to see Bond go through the mission, globetrotting from location to location. Leah Sado is excellent. The action's on point. It's the, probably the funniest of the modern movies. Like The World Is Not Enough, the pre-titles is one of my favourite. But sadly, it's the plot and the villain which lets down this movie. I was in school when the announcement for Spectre happened, and hearing that Christoph Waltz was going to be the main villain was like hearing I just won the lotto. Everyone knew he was going to be Blofeld, but ultimately the story and how he was written was a complete letdown. Blofeld feels like the biggest missed opportunity of the series. They had the perfect actor, but they just couldn't make it work. The story starts off quite intriguing, but never really finds its feet. Nonetheless, I have a lot of love for this movie. 16. And counting. 16th place might seem a bit harsh for Skyfall, but from everything here on, I absolutely adore. The story for Skyfall is one of the best in the entire series. Javier Bardem as Silva is one of the best villains in the series. He gives a charismatic and unsettling performance, coupled with a really interesting revenge plot and classic Bond action, makes for a wonderful movie. 
I love how predominantly M is featured in the movie and the climax of her dying is both shocking and really emotional. It's brilliantly directed by Sam Mendes and might be the best looking Bond of them all. It's beautifully shot by Roger Deakins and, and it's a worthy movie to carry Bond into his 50th anniversary. With all that said, I've always had a few gripes with this movie, which keeps it from getting like really high on the list. Bond being past it when he's only in his third movie has really bugged me. It's like we've missed the peak of his career post Quantum of Solace, but also feels very dour and doesn't have as much charm or charisma as we see in Casino and eventually we'll see in Spectre. And whoever signed off on that haircut should be fired. 15. And counting. When they re-released all the Bond movies in the cinema for the 60th anniversary, I got to go to a grand total of two. The last of those was Tomorrow Never Dies. This is one of the movies that over the years has gone up on my list. It's the most action-packed Bond where he just decides to kill everyone. I've said it before and I'll say it again, Pierce is Pierce and he's just as brilliant as ever. Elliot Carver is one of my favourite villains, he's so silly and Jonathan Price gives one of the hammiest performances and it's absolutely delightful. Michelle Yeoh is easily the most badass Bond girl of the series. It also has my favourite henchman of the series, Dr. Kaufman. Again, it's very silly but also very funny and very charming. I am a professor of forensic medicine. Believe me, Mr. Bond, I could shoot you from Stuttgart and still create the proper effect. The action is incredible too. The parking lot chase, the bike chase, investigating the newspaper printing factory and the end fight on the stealth ship. It's probably the most exciting Bond movie of them all. This is also David Arnold's first movie on the soundtrack and it's one of the best. Backseat Driver is one of my favourite cues of all time. Does the movie have problems? Yes. Do I care? No. 40. And counting. Moonraker is the first Bond movie I ever watched. I have faint memories of Bond fighting the snake in the pool from when I was really, really young. Along the same lines as Tomorrow Never Dies, do I care that this is one of the sillier Bonds of the series? No. Do I absolutely love it? Most certainly. Roger is in full swing here. He has some excellent moments. Drax is a camp but menacing villain. I love how he's constantly trying to get his henchmen to go and kill Bond. Look after Mr. Bond. See that some harm comes to him. And his goal of starting a civilization in space is absolutely bonkers. Holly Goodhead is your typical Bond girl, but has some fun snarky moments with Bond. The movie itself also brings Bond on his globe-trotting best, spanning four continents and space itself. Honestly, Moonraker may not be everyone's cup of tea, but for me it provides everything I want in a light-hearted, charming Roger Bond. 13. And counting. At number 13 is You Only Live Twice. Now I have a few problems with this movie. Connery is sadly at his worst in the series. Aki and Kissy probably should have been the one character. And like Diamonds Are Forever, it can feel kind of plodding at times. But You Only Live Twice is the very definition of classic Bond. The plot is fantastical, but it's so Bondian. The locations and the sets are exotic and grand in scale. Blofeld is the most iconic villain of the series. He's played at his absolute best here by Donald Pleasance. The climax itself, I think, puts it this far up on the list. I get giddy every time we get to see the inside of the volcano. The script is also fun and, oddly enough, written by Roald Dahl. Tiger Tanaka is one of the best allies and John Barry is firing on all the cylinders with his score. Iconic is probably one of the best words you could use to describe this movie. And also it has ninjas and ninjas are just the best. 12. And counting. I get the feeling among most Bond fans that License to Kill has skyrocketed in popularity over recent years. Timothy Dalton is one of the highlights of the movie, providing a hard-edged yet soft performance who's ruthless in his pursuit of Fran Sanchez, a villain who is as equally ruthless as James Bond. Sanchez transcends the typical Bond villain who wants to take over the world and is instead just a drug lord, but he feels more dangerous and scarier than nearly every other Bond villain combined. This is the movie where the idea of Bond going rogue is at its best. They try it in later movies, but here it feels most genuine. Michael Kamen provides a very good score, which complements the relentless action. It does feel like a late 80s action movie, but its unique stories and interesting characters make it a great Bond flick. 11. And counting. 
it's the one that started it all. One of the reasons I love Dr. No is how effortlessly the story flows. We're introduced to James Bond, a double O agent who was sent to Jamaica to investigate a death of a fellow agent. It's simple but effective. A lot of what I love about Bond is introduced here, and it's perfected in the later movies. It feels like a Sunday afternoon detective show. It's easy to watch, and before you know it, the movie's over. Dr. No is a great first villain. He's ominous and casts a shadow over the entire movie. Honey Rider is the standard bearer for all the Bond girls to come. Felix and Quarrel are really fun allies. Jamaica is a classic location. The movie is the perfect introduction to Bond, and I always have a great time watching it. 10. And counting. The last time I watched Live and Let Die was the most fun I've ever had watching a Bond movie. A couple of friends and I watched this movie, and we couldn't stop laughing and smiling throughout. It epitomised everything I loved most about James Bond. A thrilling, funny, all-round entertaining romp. Roger Moore effortlessly settles into the role of James Bond, playing it like he's been doing it all his life. Dr. Kananga is a calculated villain with an interesting plot and a roster of excellent henchmen. The score is funky and it stands out as one of my favourites. Jane Seymour plays Solitaire, the kept woman, beautifully. And the script is filled with hilarious dialogue. Well, hello, Jim. What's happening, baby? It's one of the most fun Bond movies there is and... I always have an incredibly fun time watching it. 9. And counting. No Time to Die is the most recent and probably the most controversial Bond of them all. In truth, I've only seen this movie four times. Three in the cinema and once at home on Blu-ray when it was released. I remember watching it for the first time and being absolutely stunned by the ending, but also having this real sense of finalisation. The story comes full circle. In the years since its release, and the more I think about it, the more I realise my love for Daniel's whole tenure as 007. It most definitely has its problems. Blofeld is wasted and some of the dialogue was absolutely cringy. Die! Blofeld! Die! Jesus! But I adore how different and bold this movie is. I understand that most Bond fans want classic James Bond back, 007 going into M's office and getting a new mission and following him on his adventures, but as a story, it's one of my favourite films in the series. I love the five film journey Bond goes on from Casino to here, and for me it felt like the natural ending. With it being the most recent Bond, it's hard to place it on this list. I could go on and on about this movie, maybe I will someday, but for now it sits at number nine. Eight. And counting. From Russia With Love is a lot of Bond fans' favourite Bond movie, and for very good reason. Sean Connery is outrageously good in this movie. He's upped his performance from Dr. No and gives the most Fleming-esque performance of the entire series. The tone of this movie always stands out for me. It's atmospheric and dark. A proper Cold War thriller with some Bondian elements before the franchise found its lasting identity with Goldfinger. Red Grant is formidable and the fight scene on the Orient Express is the highlight of a movie filled with great moments. It's always cool seeing the inner workings of Spectre in these early Bond films and Rosa Klebb makes for a really nasty and uncomfortable villain. Like Dr. No, it zips by and I love how Bond goes from fighting on a train to being attacked by Spectre's helicopters and then being attacked by a boat and then being attacked by a poisonous shoe. It's Fleming's 007 at his very best. 7. And counting. After a six year absence, James Bond returned to the big screen with Goldeneye. The more I think about this movie, the more I think about it as maybe the perfect Bond movie. And I'm saying that quite a bit. I feel like everything from here on out is like the perfect Bond movie. Pierce is no problem settling into the role as 007, bringing his effortless charm, which is quite similar to Sean. The quadruple threat of villains is great, as they all bring their own set of strengths to the table. Sean Bean as 006, Bond's equal, is fantastic and he gives a great smarmy but in the end quite a paranoid performance. 
Senya Onatop is one of the best femme fatales in the series, equal parts sexy and dangerous. General Ormov brings the initial threat, a Soviet hero who's secretly working for Yanis in 006, and Boris, the tech expert too, is in fact not invincible. Natalia is also a really interesting Bond girl who has her own motives for revenge on the villains. The action is superb, the tank chase is thrilling, and that damn jump is just iconic. The climax is also one of my favourites in the Bond series, with Bond dealing out one of his coldest kills and one-liners to date. No. And I got through this entire section without mentioning GoldenEye 64 once. Oh, damn it! Six. And five. And counting. Right, it might seem weird that I'm lumping The Spy Who Loved Me and Goldfinger together, but in a weird way, they kind of both do the exact same thing for me. They're James Bond basically at his best. Roger and Connery are both perfect in each movie. Spy and Goldfinger are maybe the best examples ever of nailing down the Bond formula. Everything on the list gets ticked off. The plot's great. The music's great, the locations are great, the action's great, the performances are great, the villains are great, the Bond girls are great, the henchmen are great, the cars are great, the gadgets are great, the one-liners are great, the pre-titles is great, the climaxes are great, and so on and so on. It's all there. It's really nothing else to say. It's just everything's great. Four. And counting. For me, Thunderball is where the character of James Bond is at his absolute peak. The movie can be quite slow at times, the underwater scenes drag and, and seeing Bond have to catch up to us, the viewer, can be quite infuriating. There are much better Bond movies, but the reason this sits so high on my list is because of how much I love Bond. The one-liners, the charm, the swagger, and him just being the coolest person in the room at any given point is on full display here. There's a lot to love about this movie too though. The music's great, Largo's a classic villain, Domino is one of the most beautiful women to ever grace this earth, the Bahamas encompasses everything that is Bond in every way, the plot is absurd and wonderful, but those moments where Bond is at his very best make it for me. Shooting the clay pigeon from the hip, handing Fiona her flip-flops in the bathroom, what sharp little eyes you've got, shooting Vargas with the spear, it's all these moments and more which make it one of my very favourites. Three. And counting. It goes without saying that I love all of the top three, but I think these are the most important Bond movies in my life. The Living Daylights is a film I've always been very fond of, but cemented its place in my top three after my most recent viewing. It was in Vienna with a group of fellow Bond fans. We got to visit some of the locations in the movie and it was a really, really great experience. Timothy Dalton is great in his first outing as Bond. It's as close to Fleming as you can get, maybe only second to From Russia With Love. The tone of the movie also really stands out for me. Moving on from the maybe lighter Roger days, the movie exists in this area of light-hearted and darkness. It's a really kind of grey movie in that regard. The action is wonderful and the introduction to Bond is arguably the best in the series. There's so much to love in this movie, but it's high up, one, due to the film's quality, and two, for the sentimental reasons. Two. And counting. The first time I watched Honor Majesty's Secret Service, I shed a tear at the ending. Unlike a lot of other Bond fans, I went into Majesty's knowing about the history of George Lazenby, how he got the role and the reception the movie has had among fans since. For some of the fans, this is the movie in between Sean's final two, and for some of the others, it's a masterpiece. I sit firmly on the side of absolutely loving it. Realistically, I don't think this is a masterpiece, it has its problems, but doesn't every Bond movie? Lazenby isn't as good as the rest, but he has an aura and confidence which I think fits Bond perfectly. Diana Rigg is outstanding as Tracy, a broken woman who falls in love with Bond only to meet a tragic end. I'm personally a fan of when the movies lean in on Bond's love life, and this is one of the movies where it gets perfected. There's so much I could say about Majesties, but you know, I think I'm going to save that for another day. One. And counting. I knew it wasn't going to be the most original Bond list, okay? But Casino Royale is just 
incredible. It's a movie where every time watching it is like a brand new experience, rediscovering my love for it. Daniel is exceptional, giving the perfect performance that encompasses everything great about the character. Lashif is my favourite villain. Mads Mikkelsen is so sinister and yet vulnerable. Vesper is my favourite Bond girl. The way she dissects Bond's character on the train to Montenegro is probably my favourite scene in the series. The parkour chase is exhilarating and the poker scenes get so tense it stresses me out. The movie goes beyond just being a great Bond film but goes into another dimension where honestly I think it's one of the greatest films ever made. And that's the list. I've spent so long trying to make this video. Over the past few years, I've always ended up putting it off and procrastinating about it. But here it is. I've put it out into the ether. And hopefully you guys don't crucify me in the comments. Uh, we can all be very civil about it. And I think if you take anything away from this list, it's how much I care and love James Bond and the community of fans. That's kind of taken me in over the past few years. It's it's the only community I'm really a part of. And I think it's one of the best on the internet. If you enjoyed the list, you can like and subscribe. Do all the usual stuff you know yourself. But that's all for now. And Michael Kerwin will return soon. <laughs>